it's day eight of the trial at Liverpool Crown Court in the murder of Ashley Dale. Hi guys, so we're back at Liverpool Crown Court for day eight of the trial. Six men are charged in connection with the murder of Ashley Dale. Just a quick reminder of who is who in court. For the prosecution, the lead counsel is Paul Greenery, King's counsel, assisted by junior counsel, Alex Longhorn and Holly Meanery. Defending Joseph Pears is Peter Wright, King's counsel, assisted by Christopher Stables. Defending Sean Zeisk is Adam Davies, King's counsel, assisted by Tim Fort. Defending Nal Barry is Stan Rees, King's counsel, assisted by Katie Appleton. Defending Ian Fitzgibbon is Professor John Cooper, King's counsel, assisted by Jamie Baxter. Defending James Witham is Richard Pratt, King's counsel, assisted by Tom Watson. Defending Callum Radford is Stephen Swift, assisted by Kyra Badman. The judge overlooking the case is Mr Justice Goose. So the first witness of the day, as you can tell by the intro, is Andre de Villas Hall. And he has been called by Paul Greenery to give evidence. So as you'll know, Andre de Villas Hall has testified in many cases across the UK and all over the world. His experience expands to nearly 40 years and he's examined nearly three and a half thousand firearms. As I stated previously, he is world renowned and he's respected in his field. So starting the questioning, Mr Greenery asks, you are here to assist us with the circumstances in which Ashley Dale was killed. In this case, you were given information by the police about basic facts at a very early stage. Mr Horn replies, yes, that is correct. Mr Greenery says, were you then asked to attend the scene? Yes, says Mr Horn. He also confirms his duties include, he assists the police with the location of fired ammunition components. He helps them to find cartridges and parts of cartridges and interpreting the physical evidence and provided an opinion as to what happened. He says Mr Hall attended the scene shortly before 10am on August 21st, 2022. He shows a jury a plastic model of a cartridge. Mr Horn says a cartridge contains four components. He says these include the projectile, which is called the bullet, then a cartridge case, which houses the other components, known as a primer, and a propellant or gunpowder to drive the bullet. He also explains that the primer contains a small amount of explosive, which ignites when the primer is struck by the hammer of the firearm. The primer then ignites a propellant, which creates a huge increase in pressure, which in turn drives the bullet down the barrel of the gun towards the target the shooter is aiming at. Paul Greenery asks, it has been determined that the weapon used to kill Ashley Dale was a Scorpion machine pistol. Mr Horn replies, yes. Paul Greenery says, I'm going to ask you to hold up and explain such a weapon in a moment. Can you describe the difference between a machine gun and a gun that is not a machine gun? Mr Horn says, firearms come in different configurations, types and firing modes. You get handheld firearms, pistols. You get shoulder held pistols, rifles or guns, shotguns for example. Pistols can be designed to discharge single shots. You would need to remove the cartridge case and insert a fresh cartridge manually by hand. Or you could have a number of cartridges contained within the firearm so you could discharge more than one shot and fire several times. He says a semi-automatic pistol would allow a firer to keep on pulling the trigger and every time you pull the trigger a discharge will occur and it will load a fresh cartridge. 
Mr. Horn also says for the purpose of war, it was considered adventurous to create a weapon that fired multiple shots with one pull of the trigger. And that is how machine guns or submachine guns were developed. Mr. Horn also says, the moment you add the term machine, if you pull the trigger, it will keep on firing until you release the trigger. So Paul Greenery asks, how was it that it determined the gun used was a Scorpion machine pistol? Mr. Horn says, when firearms are designed, you've got a set of design features. The blueprint of the gun, the Scorpion machine pistol gun, has an interesting feature which is unique. That is, it has two ejector prongs, which is unique to scorpions. It ejects the cartridges, cases, from the top. Here, there were many cartridges discovered, and an examination of those showed features characteristics of being ejected by a scorpion machine pistol. Paul Greenery asked him to explain how a scorpion works. He says, is a scorpion a new weapon or a long established weapon? Mr. Horn says, it's been around for a number of years. The Scorpion machine pistol was designed in 1959 and put into production in 1961. That's when it first appeared and it's been produced ever since. Paul Greenery asked them to show the Scorpion machine gun to the jury. And this is then held up in court. Paul Greenery says, you can use that to illustrate the various aspects of your evidence. Obviously, Mr. Horn holds up the weapon, and it's in his right hand. The jury are told that the gun is a real weapon, but it has been decommissioned. The gun is black, and it also has a brown handle, like the one featured in this video. Mr. Horn says, what we have here is a Scorpion machine pistol. The Scorpion machine pistol is magazine fed. He shows the magazine to the jury which also holds the cartridges and attaches it to the magazine well of the gun with an audible click. Mr. Horn says, the machine pistol also has a stock that folds over the top. If it is your preference, you could either fire it just from the hand or you could bring the stock into your shoulder and fire it from a shoulder position for more control. It has a selector switch, which has got three settings. They are indicated by a zero a 1 and a 20. When it's on 0, then it is on safe. That would block any movement of the trigger. If you move the switch to 1, it would be capable of firing single shots. You would have to pull the trigger for each discharge. If you move the selector switch to 20, that is a mode where it fires in fully automatic mode. If you held down the trigger, it would keep on firing until you release the trigger or run out of ammunition. Mr. Horn also says the magazines come in different configurations. The one he shows to the jury holds 10 or 30 shots. Paul Greenery says the shooter could have with him another magazine that would be inserted. Andre Horn says once you run out of ammunition in one magazine, you could quickly release it and take another, insert it, and carry on shooting. Mr. Holt shows the jury the ejection port on the top of the weapon, where the cartridge cases are ejected from. Paul Greenery says, if the gun is in fully automatic mode, how quickly are rounds discharged? Mr. Horn says, the Scorpion machine pistol is designed to discharge cartridges at a rate of 850 to 900 rounds per minute. It is between 14 and 15 rounds per second. If you keep the trigger pressed for one second, 14 to 15 rounds will come out of the muzzle of this gun. Paul Greenery says he will now turn to Mr. Horn's examination of 40 links the road. He gets a floor plan of the address and shows it to the jury. Paul Greenery says, this is showing the layout of the ballistics evidence. Cartridges and cartridge fragments recovered from the ground floor of 40 Minster Road. You attended the scene on the morning of August the 21st, just over nine hours after the killing had occurred. Did you notice the front door had been horsed in? 
Mr. Horn says yes. The door frame was actually still intact. It was a centre panel that had been bashed in. That was lying in the hallway. Paul Greenery says, that was still there when you arrived, the panel. Mr. Horn says, it was still there. It had been picked up by CSI staff and moved out of the way. Paul Greenery says, had some steps been taken to ensure you could undertake your work without disturbing forensic evidence at the scene? Mr. Horn says, there were stepping plates laid out on the floor. The jury then shown examples of those plates, which are placed there by crime scene investigators, so evidence is not disturbed by people walking through the area. Paul Greenery says, you were able to carry out your examination. And Mr. Horn says yes. Paul Greenery says, one of the reasons why these plates were there was to preserve footwear impressions. There were footwear impressions of Mr. Witham on the ground and first floor. Did you identify a fire 9mm short cartridge on the doormat near the front door? Andre Horn says yes, that's correct. 9mm reference to the diameter of the bullet. The barrel of the gun and the projectile that fires is 9mm. You get different cartridge case configurations in specific calibres. In 9mm, you have different lengths of cartridge cases. This has a length of 17 millimetres. Those cartridge cases are referred to as 9 millimetre short because there are ones that are longer than that. Scorpion submachine guns were designed to discharge cartridges of 7.65 millimetres. As time went on, they started manufacturing them to discharge at a range of 9 millimetre cartridges. He also says identical cartridges were found in the wall in the hallway near the door to the living room, in the hallway opposite the living room door, and another in a similar position. Paul Greenery says, when a shot is fired, ultimately the bullet is going to hit something. Sometimes may the bullet hit something else on the way to where it rests. Andre Horn says yes, of course. When they strike something else prior to striking the surface, where it comes to rest, we call that an intermediate target. It will either go through or skip off the intermediate target. Where it skips off, we call that a ricochet. It will leave a mark and a subsequent mark where it actually stops. Paul Greenery says, within the hallway, were there evidence of impact marks or ricochet? Mr. Horn says, I didn't find any impact or ricochet marks in the hallway. I requested the carpet on the stairs to be lifted to be sure there aren't any impact marks hidden by the carpet. I was informed there were no impact marks on the stairs at the bottom end of the hallway either. He also says there were four cartridges in the hallway near the door. He goes on to say, when cartridge cases are ejected, they might strike things depending on the orientation the gun is held. You could potentially turn the gun sideways, in which case he would eject to the left or the right. In the confines of a room, you might strike walls or ceilings, bounce from there and come to rest somewhere in that room. If you have a lot of foot traffic, when people initially attend the scene and don't know what is going on, they may actually unintentionally transport or kick cartridge cases away from the positions they landed. They may not be still in the location they landed but move before the scene is secured. Paul Greenery says, we see cartridges disturbed from the front door, through the dining room and into the kitchen. Is the finding of cartridges in the hallway consistent with the proposition of the gunman, James Witham, starting to discharge the firearm just inside the house? Mr Horn says, not necessarily. The cartridge case may have been kicked over there by footfall. I would have to find impact in the hallway. If I don't, I have to assume that the case was discharged in close proximity to where it was found, but may have been moved by footfall. Paul Greenery says, let's move on to the dining room. As we can see from the plan, no cartridges were found in the living room itself. The dining room is to the right. Did you examine that room? Mr Horn replies, yes, 
who did make a brief examination of the living room for impact marks, but did not find any. We moved on to the dining room. Paul Greenery says, there was a line of sight from the dining room doorway into the kitchen. And Mr Horn says yes. Paul Greenery says, in the dining room, did you find bullet impact marks? Mr Horn says, there were a number of impact marks in the dining room. There were also ricochet marks in the dining room. They then show the jewellery photographs of the scene. Paul Greenery says, we can see the door panel there on the floor. We've now moved inside the hallway. There is a view of the staircase and the opposite view. These are markers showing the locations of four cartridge cases found in the hallway. Mr Horn says that in some cases, multiple impact marks are caused by the same bullet ricocheting off a surface on its way to where it ultimately ends up. These are marked by investigators using letters and numbers. For example, if a bullet strikes two surfaces, the impact marks would have been marked A and A1. Paul Greenery says, we see the door leading into the dining room from the hallway. Against the wallpapered wall, there are two ricochet marks. On the second photograph, you can also see the relation of those impact marks with the impact marks against the wall. A1 is where that bullet has ended up. We see two together. We see A, a bullet striking its way on a wall to A1, where there is a bullet sized mark. Ultimately, we're going to interpret all of this. At the moment, I'm just going to ask you what you found. We see A and A1 in the dining room. Mr. Horn says B was a ricochet off that wallpapered wall. B1 was above the doorway, leading to the kitchen. Mr. Horn says, B was a ricochet off that wallpapered wall. Paul Greenery says, B1 was above the doorway, leading into the kitchen. Mr. Horn says, that's correct, yes. Paul Greenery says, we can see the damage that bullet has caused to the wall on the way to where it ended up. Mr. Horn says, well, that's correct. Paul Greenery says, C, there is no C1. Is C just where the third bullet has ended up above the doorway? And Mr. Horn says, yes, that's correct. C was a direct strike. It struck the wall above the kitchen door just under A1 and B1. Paul Greenery says, what was D? Mr. Horn says, D was another bullet impact mark on the wall, just to the right of the kitchen doorway. That was a direct strike. It was caused by a bullet. Paul Greenery says, no ricochet on its way to the right-hand side of the door. And Mr Horn says, no. Paul Greenery says, E please, can you explain that? Mr Horn says, E is incorrectly marked. It should be E1. I found a ricochet mark on the floor, which I associate with that impact. That bullet had penetrated into the wall and was subsequently recovered by CSI personnel at the scene. Paul Greenery says, we can see where you have marked a ricochet, E, before the bullet has ended up, and then E1. Mr Horn says yes. Paul Greenery says, where we had a ricochet mark on the floor, where was the barrel of the gun pointed at at the time? Mr. Horn says the barrel of the gun would have been pointed directly at the ricochet mark. Over very short distances, we consider trajectory to be a very straight line. A bullet that directly impacted the wall, that's where the muzzle of the gun was pointed. He explains the muzzle is a front part of the barrel where the bullet leaves the gun. He again holds the scorpion up and he points to the muzzle part of the gun. Paul Greenery continues and he says, Did you find some small marks on the ceiling above the impact A1, B1 and C where fragments have struck the ceiling? Mr Horn replies, Yes, that's correct. More often you would have bullets that are made of either 
lead or copper or a combination of lead and copper. In this case, we had two bullets, which had copper alloy jackets. A jacket is exactly what you would deduce it to be, something that covers a central part, which is called the core. The central bit filled with lead is what we refer to as the core. When the core and the jacket are still attached to one another, we would call that a bullet. If they strike something and the bullet breaks up because of the impact, we would refer to them as fragments. Paul Greenery says, five ammunition components were found in the dining room. Mr. Horn says, that's correct. Paul Greenery says, an impact damaged bullet was found. A fired nine millimeter short caliber cartridge of a different brand, Maxtech. This was found between the kitchen floor and the hallway. An impact damage fired bullet jacket was found between the hallway doorway and the kitchen doorway. An impact damage fired bullet was also found on the bench at the dining room table. A fired 9mm short calibre cartridge case of Celia and Bellia brand under the dining room table was also found. A cartridge case of the same calibre but off the Maxtech brand under the dining room table was found. Then an identical cartridge against the rear wall, the wall shared with the kitchen, an impact damage fired bullet under the dining room table, a fragment of lead core from a fired bullet against the wall opposite the hallway door, and a nine millimeter cartridge of the Celia and Bello brand. More fragments were discovered by crime scene investigators. Mr. Horn says, against the kitchen wall, there were some items stacked there which we couldn't move at the time. As the scene was cleared and all the footmark evidence, some of these items were removed. They found a number of small fragments which may have shattered off bullets during impact. Paul Greenery says, earlier, I asked whether the gun had been discharged in the hallway. The defining feature was ricochet or impact marks. We have ricochet marks in the dining room. So what does that indicate? Mr. Horn says, my interpretation is that the shooter had even been standing in the doorway from the hallway or within the dining room itself. So Paul Greenery says, the jury is now well aware that the kitchen of Ashley's home was at the rear of the house. Did you find bullet impact marks in the kitchen? Mr. Horn says, yes, I have. Paul Greenery says, what was F? Mr. Horn says, F was a ricochet mark on the tiled floor below the kitchen counter. Paul Greenery said, had the bullet perforated the plastic trim of the washing machine just above the floor? Mr. Horn says, yes. You can see the washing machine door is open. When bullets ricochet from surfaces, they don't come up at the same angle. They hug the surface they ricochet from. That bullet perforated the plastic trim at the bottom of the washer. It was recovered on the floor behind the washer. Paul Greenery says, we can see that there is F and F1. It strikes the floor and hits the washing machine. Mr. Horn says, that's correct, yes. Paul Greenery says, we see G, what is G? Mr. Horn says, G was a bullet impact against the tiled wall tiles just below the kitchen cabinet above the kitchen counter. It was a direct shot onto the wall tiles. Paul Greenery says, next is H and H1. What were those please? And Mr. Horn says, H was a ricochet mark against the ceiling close to the back wall of the kitchen. The bullet struck the ceiling then penetrated the wall of H1. H1 is a hole in the wall in the plastered area where the bullet had gone into the wall. Paul Greenery says, we have an N, but no I or J or K or L. Why is that? Mr. Horton says, there was another small bullet hole on one of the bar stools, which we hadn't found during our initial examination. We continued numbering the bullet holes upstairs following the sequence we had already had. 
when the hole in the bar stool was found. That then followed the sequence we had upstairs. Paul Greenery says, when we look upstairs, we will see those letters. What was N? Mr. Horn says, N was a bullet hole in the back seat rest of the bar stool standing at the kitchen counter. The bullet has perforated that and come to rest in the wooden framework of the chair. Mr. Greenery says, this is an important finding, is it not? Mr. Horn says it is. Mr. Greenery says, there are four shots, aren't there? F, G, H and N. Is there any view about the direction of which those shots were fired? Mr. Horn says, approximately, all the shots in the kitchen and the dining room have been fired in the same direction. I mean the same compass direction, not up or down. They were all more or less fired in the direction of the doorway. F, N, G and H had gone through the doorway and into the kitchen. They were fired through the doorway and had stopped in the kitchen. Paul Greenery said, there are a number of ways in which the gun can be fired. Randomly or at a target. Does this tend to favour one of those approaches in your view? Mr Horn says, they were all fired in the same direction. And I would favour the proposition that they were perhaps fired at a target as opposed to just randomly. And that's the end of Andre de Villa's Horn, part one. I'm going to have a break.